quite a bit lately you hear talk shows on the radio. It's a new phenomenon of the last several years and it's quite popular. Oftentimes you find people arguing even on these talk shows. One saying one thing is right, another saying another is right, especially as you come down regarding issues. What is right? They often ask people. The usual answer is the opposite of wrong. But then what is wrong? And so we can go on in circles. To understand what is right and what is wrong in society, we need to have a standard. There must be some type of standard by which we use. In society, when a standard changes, there's an upheaval in the environment. Some laws are considered right today. Some laws are changed. When a country takes over another country, laws are changed. Well, what is a standard that does not change? The only standard that I have found that never changes is the Bible. The Bible is the standard that has survived all the centuries from the very beginning of time. In order to see how changeless and dependable the Bible is, let us take a look at what is the Bible. It would be useless to read someone else's opinion about the Bible. We can read pros and cons and we can argue about it. But the most important thing that we can ever do is take a look at the Bible itself. Let us take a look and see what the Bible says about itself. Later on in this series, we're going to be able to study a few prophecies to show that the Bible is the Word of God. But let us see what the Bible says about it. First of all, let us see what the Bible says about man. Let us look at Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. The Bible says that we are cursed if we trust merely in a human being. So now let us take a look. What does the Bible say about itself? How was the Bible given to us? How do we get the Bible in our hands? Well, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all Scripture, how much? All, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So the Bible is given to us for several reasons. But number one, it was given to us by inspiration of God. Now, what do we mean by inspiration of God? How did God inspire someone to write the Bible? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. It tells us what does it mean that it was given by inspiration of God. It says here, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit came upon holy men, upon righteous men. And as the Holy Spirit came upon these righteous men, they were moved and they wrote down what God told them. It, they didn't just sit down and decide one day, oh, let me write something. No, the Holy Spirit moved them to write. We find in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6, in which way did they come to understand what God wanted them to write? Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So how does God reveal himself to them? God reveals himself to the prophets by visions and by dreams. So now, does this mean that whenever there is a dream or a vision, it is automatically from the Lord? Or instead, does it depend on certain conditions? Well, let's take a look in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder come to pass, Wherever he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. In other words, even if a so-called prophet comes to you, he does some miracles, he even prophesies a few things and they come to pass, even if all that happens, that is not enough to identify a messenger of God. If he turns, leads you to turn away from the Word of God, then that is a false prophet. It is satanic. In the very next verse, back in their days, what they were supposed to do with that type of prophet, they were supposed to stone him. So we see that there are dreams that come from God, and God speaks to his prophets, but then there are dreams also that are inspired by Satan, that are satanic. And those type of dreams lead people away from obeying God. Well, those we are not to listen to. Well, but there are other kind of dreams as well. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 8. Jeremiah 29, verse 8 identifies another type of dreams. And here's what it says. Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. Notice here he says, do not listen to them because they cause their own dreams to be dreamed. Yes, you can actually think about something long enough and you start dreaming about it. So these false prophets, they thought about something quite heavily and they began to dream about them and they said, well, we had a dream. But they were telling the truth. They did have a dream, but that dream was not coming from the Lord. Also, there are other kinds of dreams and these dreams come because of overwork. So many ideas that we have running through our mind. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3 identify this particular type of dreams. It says, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business. So quite a bit of business transactions going on can also cause dreams. And then, of course, there's another category of dreams. And these are the most common dreams. These dreams everyone has. And Ecclesiastes 5 identify these type of dreams. Down a little bit further in verse 7. It says there, For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also divers vanities. So in other words, there's many dreams coming around, and yet they are all vain. Now there are many other evidences that the Lord has revealed in His Word so that we may test the prophets to discern between the true and the false. But the truth of it all is found in some of these following verses. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 32. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 is an important identifying mark on finding out whether something is from God or not. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 says, The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Notice here, what is it? The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, each prophet is subject to the other prophet. For example, we know, recognize that Moses was one of the first prophets. Well, he was the first prophet that wrote in the Bible. And so, after we recognized Moses was a prophet of God, along comes Samuel. And we think that, oh, Samuel might be a prophet. Well, Samuel is subject to the prophet that we already recognize. For example, he's subject to Moses. Now, later on comes Isaiah. Isaiah comes on the scene and he also, it seems like he's a prophet too. Well, you test him. But how do you test him by? You test him both by Moses and by Samuel. And then you come down to Malachi. Well, you have to test Malachi by all the previous prophets. So every time there comes a prophet, we must test them by the prophets because the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Another thing that we need to test them by is found in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. It says, When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we must test everyone how? To the law and to the testimony. 
So as we take a look at our Bible, if we look through its pages, we have the law of God. We must test everyone by the law and the testimony. The testimony being the rest of the other prophets. So we must test every prophet by that. If a prophet comes and says anything that is contrary to the Word of God, then we must condemn that prophet and reject them. Another question that we may have is, are the scriptures infallible? Infallibility is a very important word. Is it something that never can be changed? Let us take a look at a couple of statements from the Bible about the Bible because about itself because our God that we worship must be a God that does not change. Let us take a look about first of all even about God. Let us go to the book of Malachi. In Malachi identifies a certain characteristic about the God that we worship. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Malachi 3 and verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. The God that we worship, He never changes. He does not change. What about Jesus Christ? Does Jesus Christ change? We find also in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the God that we worship does not change. He is changeless. What about His Word? Let us take a look. Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Psalm chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Notice here what it say about the words of God. They are pure words like silver being purified seven times. In other words, God's word is absolutely pure. Further, it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So our God has promised that what is written here, He is going to preserve them. We may think to ourselves, oh, this was written several thousand years ago. And in those thousands of years, things could have changed. Yes, it can be true that that could have been changed. But you know something? God says He's going to preserve it for us. So if there's anything of importance that you and I need to know to take us to that eternal world, God has promised that He is going to preserve them for us till the very end of time. We, thus we may conclude that the Bible itself is infallible. Jesus says a little bit about it too in Matthew 24, verse 35. Matthew 24 and verse 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. This word is not going to pass away. Heaven may pass away. You look above you. Is the heaven still up there? Yes, it is. Is the earth still down below your feet? Yes, it is. God's word will never, never pass away. Also, let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. What part of the Scriptures can we consider infallible? Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. How many words? It says here, Every word of God is pure. So from cover to cover, from beginning to the very end, this word is absolutely pure. And God will shield those of us who put our trust in Him. The psalmist emphasizes a little bit more in Psalm 119, verse 60, the marginal reading. It says, The beginning of thy word is true, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. In other words, it endures forever. God's Word is eternal. It never changes. Isaiah 40 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. This Word is going to stand forever. It's not going to be just a little while. This Word is going to be eternal. It stands from now till, till eternity. Well, if this Word is eternal and this Word is 
pure and this word is infallible, then how are we to receive this word? How are we to accept these words? Are we to consider them merely as the opinion of the writers? Do we say, oh, that was Paul's opinion, oh, that's Isaiah's opinion, or that's Jeremiah's opinion? Is that how we're to treat it? Let us take a look. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. What was the psalmist all about? He says that the word of God was on his tongue. When he spoke, it was not his words. When he wrote, they were not writing their own words. They were writing the word of God. Jeremiah also reinforces that in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I form thee, in the belly I knew thee. So before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So before he was even there in, as, a, as a fetus in the mother's womb, God anointed Jeremiah to be a prophet. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Whatever I tell you, you are going to speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So the word of God was placed in the mouth of Jeremiah. And that is how Jeremiah was able to be a prophet of God. Apostle Paul also says about his own words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So when the people listened to the words of Paul, what did they recognize? They did not recognize this merely as Paul talking about his own opinion. Oh no, what was it rather? It was Paul was speaking God's word. And so when we are reading these things, we should not consider them as the opinions of different writers. It's not Paul's opinion. It is God writing to you and me. We need to consider this as a personal letter from God. God is talking to us. God wants us to have an understanding heart. God wants to reveal something to us. Now what is the purpose of God speaking all these things to us? What is the purpose of these things being revealed to us? Let's look at Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. And here's what this prophet says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. It says here that God will do nothing. God, that great creator of the universe, that God who is in control of everything, that God says He is not going to do anything major on this earth except He reveals it unto His servants, the prophets. This is why, as we look at the history of this earth, many things were prophesied to take place right within these pages. It's important for us to take a look at those history and see how accurate everything was. Yes, that is the type of God that we worship. Matter of fact, that is the identifying mark of the God that we worship. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. This is again the identifying mark of our God. He says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning 
and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures. See, our God is a God that knows the end from the beginning. We may think, how is that possible? How is it possible that someone can know the end from the beginning? How is it possible for somebody to know what's going to happen 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now? Well, humanly, humanly speaking, that's an impossibility. But that is the very nature of the God that we worship. He knows what is going to happen. So that's why it says here, He declares the end from the beginning. Now, what is the purpose of the Scriptures? Why was the Bible given to us? What should we do with the words that are spoken in the Bible? Let us take a look in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John the Apostle, he was writing at the very end of his book, he writes something about the purpose of writing these things. John chapter 20, second to the last chapter, John 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. So many things that Jesus did were not written in the book. But these things are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. So what is the purpose of the things that are written here? The purpose is that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the purpose. In the Old Testament, there are many prophecies in relationship to Jesus Christ. In this series, we're going to study one of those prophecies that identify the exact year that Jesus was to be baptized and the exact year in which Jesus was to be crucified. There are many prophecies that we find in the Bible about Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for these prophecies, we would not be able to identify Jesus as the coming Messiah. Anyone could make the claims. But Jesus fulfilled those biblical prophecies to the very letter. And this is why we know that Jesus is the Messiah. To re-emphasize this point, let us read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. Why is it that the Scripture was given for us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We read this verse already, remember? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now what is it good for? It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So what is the purpose of the Scriptures? Why does God give us the Word of God? Why did He give it to us to be all under inspiration? In the first place it says here that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for several things. Let us take a look at those things that it is profitable. First of all, it is profitable for doctrine. If we want to know what doctrines we should believe, all Scripture is profitable for that purpose. We need the Scriptures to have an understanding of that. Now what are doctrines? Doctrines are simply teachings teaching us what is right. So all Scripture is profitable to teach us what is right. So all Scripture is profitable to teach us what is right. Remember we talked a little bit about that in the very beginning. People are trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong. Well, all Scripture is given for this purpose. So all Scripture is given to teach us what is right. What happens when the Scripture teaches us what is right? What do we do with it? It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For the next one is reproof. So all Scripture is given after it teaches us what is right, then it reproves us. And you know what is reproof? Reproof is showing us where we are wrong. 
So it shows us where we are wrong. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable to teach us what is right, and then it shows us where we are wrong. But that's not enough. The next one is wonderful. All scripture is profitable for correction. In other words, to correct something means to change something. So all scripture is profitable to change us. That's right. If you take the time to study the Word of God, you're going to find that the Word of God has a power to be able to change your life. Do you want that kind of a change? Well, it's found in the Scriptures. Yes, you start reading that Word, it's going to change you. So notice what it says, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and then the next one says, for instruction. in righteousness. What does instruction in righteousness mean? Well, instruction in righteousness means it's teaching you what is right. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the first one here? That's right. So when the Bible teaches you what is right, shows you where you are wrong, then changes you, the same Bible as you read it continues that process over and over again. And how long is this process continued? Because every time you search the Scriptures, every time you search the Word of God, it's going to reveal new things to you, things you didn't know about before, things you didn't even realize, but there is power in the Word of God. So all Scripture is there to teach us what is right, to show us where we are wrong, to change us, and then to instruct us in righteousness. Until when? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That is the purpose of the sacred scriptures. That is why God had given it to us. But now what is necessary on our part? Yes, all the instruction is there. All the teachings are there. But what do we need to do? What is our personal responsibility. Well, first of all, let's look at John chapter 7 and verse 17. John chapter 7 and verse 17. What do we need to do on our part in order for all this to take place? Because this is wonderful. Can you imagine that? Searching the scriptures, showing you where you are right, what, what is right, showing you where you are wrong, and then the scriptures changing you. We'll study a little bit more about the power of the Word of God in our next study. But for right now, let us take a look what is necessary on our part for this to even be possible. Well, let us take a look at this verse. John 7 verse 17 says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So it says here, if any man will do his will, if any man wants to do his will. You see, it's important for you to be willing. It is important for you to want to do the will of God. God will never force you. God will not grab you by the neck and say, okay, you're going to do this. No, you must be willing. God wants willing service from you. So as you open the scriptures and you are willing to do the will of God, that word will have power to change your life. But what do you need to do then? If you are willing, there's something else that you need to do. And let us just write some of these things a little bit here as well. What do we need to do in order for the scriptures to have the power to change us? What do we need to do. Let us take a look at the first part. Number one, we must be willing to do the will of God. So we must be willing to do the will of God. I must want God to change my life. If you want God to change your life, then yes, God will give you the power. God will give you the ability to change your entire life. Oh, but there's something else. Let's look at Acts chapter 17, verse 10 and 11. 
Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. Paul was going from place to place, and one time he went to Thessalonica, and then he went to a place called Berea. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So what did they do? Number one, they received the word of God with readiness of their mind. Received it readily. So here it says that these people in Berea, they were honorable. Why? Because the, first of all, they received the word readily. But what else did they do? They weren't satisfied with hearing the message saying, yes, this is good. We like this. Oh no, what else did they do? Number three, it says, they searched the scriptures. They searched the scriptures how often? It says they searched the scriptures daily. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. So they heard the word of God. Yes, that was very good. They responded. They were readily to hear it. They were willing to hear it. But that was not enough. They went back to the scriptures to search it daily. So you may be hearing this message. It's important for you to also have the experience of the Bereans, to receive the word of God readily with your mind, but then to search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. But how are we to search them? We must have the right spirit in searching the scriptures. Let's look at John chapter 16 and verse 13. John chapter 16 and verse 13. How are we going to know what, that we are interpreting things properly? John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. What is he going to do? He is going to guide you into all truth. So what do we need to be able to understand and have a right relationship with the Scriptures? It says here, number one, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need the help of the Spirit of God. And how do we get the help of the Spirit of God? We need to ask Him. We need to ask God. We need, we need to take time to pray to invite the Holy Spirit in our midst. And as we take time to pray, then God is going to be able to work upon our hearts and our minds and to be able to change us. But it's not enough to be just on the surface. Let us look at Proverbs 2, verses 1 to 5. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. What do we need? What is necessary on our part? What type of attitude do we need as we are searching the Scriptures? It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words, and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. How is it that you can be able to understand the Scriptures? You must have that hungering for it. You must have that thirsting to know it. You must search for it like for hid treasure. Things are not going to be revealed to you just by casually listening or casually reading. No, you must dig for it in order to find those hidden treasures. And there are plenty of treasures hiding inside this Word. It depends upon you and me. We need to take time to dig it up but you must do it with an attitude that is eager to find out the Word of God. And then, what do you need to, need to do? So, let's write that one down. Let's also write this one down here. We ask the Holy Spirit, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. And then here that we read there, we must, in, we must be in earnest. We must uh, urgent, have the sense of urgency. The sense of urgency. We must have the um, eagerness. We must realize. We must realize its value. It says they're like for hid treasure. So we must realize its its value. We must make 
The Bible must become valuable for us. It must become a part of us. In Psalm chapter 119, it tells us also what, what attitude we must have. What must we do as we find these hidden treasures? Psalm 119, let us take a look at verse 11. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And also, let us look at verse 16. Psalm 119 verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. So it says here we must do something else. We must treasure it in our heart. We must make it a part of us. So it says here, hide the word in our heart or in our mind. And it's, in other words, to hide it in our mind means that we're going to treasure it. We're going to make it a part of us. It'll be a valuable piece of our self. Now it's important for us that we search not only part of the Scriptures. It's not enough to search part. We must search all of the Scriptures. Let's take a look at the example that Jesus gave in Luke 24, verse 27. Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. When Jesus was, after His resurrection, He came out to meet with His disciples and He talked with them. And what did He do? Verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. So what did he do? What did he want the people to search? The seventh one here, it says, to search all the Scriptures. Keep in mind, in this particular passage, when Jesus is saying to search all the Scriptures, there was no New Testament. It did not exist. He began with whom? He began right from the very beginning. He began with Moses and he went through all the prophets. It's important for us to begin at the beginning and understand all the things that God has in store for you and me. And why is it important to have all of the scriptures? Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Those things that are written beforehand, they're written that you and I may have hope. Do you need hope in your life? This hope is available to all of us. You can have that hope as you search all the scriptures. In a wonderful book called Education, page 191, we read the following. Every part of the Bible is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Old Testament, no less than the New, should receive attention. As we study the Old Testament, we shall find living springs bubbling up where the careless reader discerns only a desert. If we study the Bible carelessly, what are we going to find? We're going to find a desert instead of the precious lessons that God wants for us. God has plenty of valuable springs bubbling up here. Do you want these springs? Let us look at Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 10. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 10. Isaiah 28 verse 10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You see, God has spread His jewels of truth all through the Scriptures. There are treasures of truth everywhere here. This is a treasure book full of those wonderful nuggets of truth. But what do you need to do in order to have the blessing of those nuggets of truth? What must you be willing to do? Yes, we must be willing to do the will of God. We must be ready to receive it readily. We must search the Scriptures daily. We need to prayerfully receive the Holy Spirit to guide us. We must have the sense of urgency. We must realize the value of these nuggets of truth. We must hide the Word of God in our mind. We must search all the Scriptures. We can all summarize all of that by a very simple story that Jesus gave. Luke chapter 6. Let us take a look at the special thing that we need to do that is found in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. It says, And why call ye me Lord, and do not the things which I say? 
Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show to you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat ve vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth, and doeth not, is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. There are two categories of people here. In the very first one it says that the man here, he heard the word of God and did what? He obeyed what it says. And as a result, he was building upon a foundation. The other did not do the will of God. He heard, he listened, and then he walked his own way. Well, what happens with that one? Well, he's like a man that built a house without a foundation. The stream came and what happened? That was the end. The whole house smashed over. What kind of a house are you building? Are you building a house of character that will withstand the storms of life? Do you want to build upon that eternal rock which is Jesus Christ in His Word by obedience? Or are you building upon the shifting sands of time, upon human opinions and human reasoning? Where is your spiritual foundation? I appeal to you to say with the writer of Psalm 119 verse 133, Order my steps in thy word, and let not iniquity have dominion over me. I leave you with this challenge today.